Hello and welcome to the Learning to Slay the Beast podcast, a resilience podcast where we talk about all the challenging things that we're working to overcome like anxiety, health and relationship issues. My name is Sarah. Welcome to another edition of the Learning to Slay the Beast podcast. We are going to continue our focus on tackling big things in this new year, digging in to those issues that maybe we've been too afraid to look at in the past. We have talked about how to overcome pain with Fran Garten. We talked about natural ways to address pandas pans as well with Aaron Darling, and moved into a number of new areas. This week is no exception. We're going to dive into the topic of divorce. It's something we haven't talked about too much on the podcast. We did touch on it in episode 92, How to Master Transitions with Rachel Shumway. She talked about a number of transitions and divorce was one that was an example. So if you are interested, feel free to go back to episode 92 as well. But we know that divorce is a challenging process and a life change. My parents separated when I was 17, and even at that late stage in my life, there was definitely still an impact on me, and I could obviously see the impact on my parents. So I'm interested to help support others that may be starting this mental conversation, or maybe it is an actual conversation about divorce. We're going to speak today to Karen McMahon, who's a certified relationship and divorce coach, and she's the founder of Journey Beyond Divorce. It is a great conversation. I really enjoyed talking to Karen. She and I dive into the topic of divorce, the impacts on those in the relationship, as well as if there are any kids in the relationship. She also gets into what can be done to regain your power. We talk about power a lot, as well as setting boundaries, and then also how to help your children cope during this situation. This is helpful for those involved in divorce, children of divorce, or maybe you're a supporting person to somebody that is going through a divorce right now, and just understanding it a little bit more would be helpful to kind of understand all of the emotions. I certainly learned a lot. I really never thought about this sort of dynamic of power that that we get into, and I thought it was a really great conversation. So enjoy this conversation with Karen McMahon. Do you love the Learning to Slay the Beast podcast? Well, first of all, thank you so much. Second of all, if you love the podcast and you want more and more to keep coming, I would love your support through Kofi.com. Kofi.com is a way that you can put a little money towards your favorite podcast. It can be as little as a few dollars, one time, bunch of times, whatever you feel that you can give, and it helps to cover all the costs that go associated with podcasting. So if you would like to support this podcast, please consider donating through Kofi.com. You can find the link in my Instagram feed under Linktree. It's at Sarah Lady Gluten, or you can visit Kofi, K-O- hyphen fi.com slash learning to slay the beasts. I appreciate your support, whether you can give or not. Thanks so much for listening. So welcome, Karen, to the podcast. I'm happy to connect with you today. I am excited to be here. Thanks for the invite. Perfect. So why don't we start with you providing a little bit about your background and then how you got into coaching on relationships and breakups or divorce? Yeah, great question. So I, uh, I found myself uh, facing divorce. And my divorce, um, I had been married maybe eight years, I had two kids preschool and the relationship was fairly high conflict and the divorce ended up lasting three and a half years. It was Mm -hmm. incredibly difficult. Uh, Hellacious is a word I've used in the past and Mm -hmm. it was hard on me, my ex, my kids. And uh, what I, what I do in my business uh, is was definitely born out of this because at the end of three and a half years, 
um, I felt like I had really transformed who I was and what I was doing for a living because I was a working mom. Um, it no longer fit. And so uh, after such a huge transformation, the question I kept asking is, what's my purpose? Because it, I was selling commercial printing and I was just like, it cannot be promoting ink on paper. There has to be something more important for me to do in the world. And that was the beginning of my journey to find my purpose. That makes a lot of sense. And yeah, I think um, I'm sure so many people struggle with that as well. And even myself, like trying to find, you know, change as you get a little bit older, have different life experiences, what that is. And so you then kind of moved into wanting to focus on relationships and divorce. So, so I was, I was in this in between where I was selling commercial printing. I was a single mom. Now I was, um, I was financially struggling and, uh, and I did decide to go to a, a coaching institute and get certified. And, and that was one of many leaps of faith. I remember um, my mom was helping me financially and she said, so who's going to hire you after you graduate from this program? And I was like, nobody. Uh, <laughs> so, and she was like, well, doesn't that seem a little irresponsible? You have two little kids and you're a single mom. And, and I just said, I, I've, I've prayed about this. I've, I've really done a lot of um, thinking about this and it's scary, but it, it seems like the right thing. And, and so, so that was my first leap of faith is, you know, I, I can do this, I can go through the program and I can actually create enough income to take care of myself and my kids. And, uh, and, and then the second part of your question is, uh, relationship and divorce coaching. And it was a no brainer. Uh, the, the quick definition of coaching is we help people get from where they are to where they want to be, right? So transition is a huge thing. And I just knew that I was a child of divorce. Divorce is the most upending, overwhelming, chaotic transition any of us go through because it's so multidimensional. So I knew that I was designed to work with people on divorce and divorce is really the other side of the coin of a good relationship. So what went wrong? Um, how'd you show up and, and, and what would work better? And that's really what we focus with our clients on. Okay. That makes a lot of sense. And I'm sure, yeah, there are so many emotions and, and things that come up during that work. So let's talk a little bit about what makes divorce so challenging. I mean, honestly, I'm a child of divorce. My parents divorced when I was about 17. So it was kind of later, later on in that progression, but how can we overcome some of those feelings either um, from divorce or even a breakup of being so powerless that can come up? Yeah. So first the emotional overwhelm. And, you know, if, if, if you're, if you're in a marriage with, especially with children um, and you have a bunch of years under your belt, right? There's, it's such a multidimensional transition. So you're not going to be with your kids as much. You're not going to have as much finances that get split. Somebody may stay in the marital home or both people leave. Um, some friends choose one spouse over the other. You may love or hate your in-laws, but you may not be in relationship with them anymore. Uh, you may have been a stay at home parent and you have to go back to work or, um, a working parent and you have to find more time because you want to have time with your kids. And so if you just think about it, it's like every single aspect of life shifts and changes. And if you're in a breakup, not a divorce, there's still a lot of that, especially if you were living with that person, but there's, uh, there's disconnecting from your person, your person who, you know, you would call, you would text, you would lean on, you would shop for like all of that. And so it's very, uh, it's very upending when that happens. And then to your question, how do we address that? Uh, that that's really the invitation, Sarah, as far as we're concerned at Journey Beyond Divorce, the invitation when there's a breakdown is uh, for us to make it a breakthrough. And so it's really an opportunity to look at uh, what 
invited me into this relationship? What was I attracted to? How did I show up? Uh, have I been my best self? Um, what triggers me? And um, how do I respond when I get triggered? What triggers him or her? And how do I respond when they're triggered? Like, there's so much that it's such a ripe and fertile field to do a self-examination, which invites a transformation. And so is the idea then really, I mean, I would see it that you would first be working on getting through the current situation, then maybe on the healing. And then is it also thinking a little bit like, well, if you ended up um, wanting to pursue another relationship, like how to sort of maybe approach it in a different way? Like, is that a part of the program as well? So the getting through it and the healing um, can happen side by side okay. uh, because each time there's a conflict, there's an upset, there's a trigger. Uh, you don't want to go, okay, I'll work on that in six months when, right. when I'm through this, <laughs> like you're, 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 you're just, you know, you're just facing it on a day-to-day -day basis. Yeah. And, and the idea is when when we face trial and tribulation of any type, certainly breakups and divorce, uh, we, we are invited into healing wounds. Often, you know, it's, it's wounds of the childhood, um, and, uh, and refining our character. And so, you know, we all have character defects. We all have unforgiveness or insecurity or codependence or, and so the entire process of uh, untangling your life from somebody else and examining it. And, and here's the key. There's a, we have in the United States, um, second and third marriages end in a higher rate of divorce than first marriages. And one would say, well, why is that? You know, like, wouldn't you think that they'd get it right the second time? Well, if you believe that you're breaking up with or divorcing the problem and you're not it, you're going to go out and you're going to meet the same man or woman in a different mm -hmm. body and you're going to rinse and repeat. And that's what most people do. And so it's like, I'm getting divorced because of him or her and their behaviors. And, and it's, it doesn't work that way. I'm a hundred percent responsible. My partner is a hundred percent responsible. And so if I am not looking at what I brought to the table and am working on that, then should I choose to go out and date and get into another relationship? Nothing is going to change. And so many people say exactly that. It's like, what's the saying? Um, why does this keep happening to me? Mm -hmm. And it doesn't happen to us. We're part of it. And so when we do that work, uh, what happened before doesn't happen again, because you're a different person. You are a more healed and refined and uh, person. And so you're meeting, you're healthier, and therefore you meet someone healthier. Does that make yeah, sense? Yeah, no, it, absolutely. It does. And I think, you know, when you talk about the second and third marriages too, in a way it even makes more sense because it's probably not only the, you know, you that's been divorced, but likely if it's later in life, the other person that you're marrying is coming with that similar um, background as well. And so, yeah, that's, that's quite interesting. I hadn't really thought about it that way, that that's why sometimes those relationships um, don't don't end up lasting. Um, and then you mentioned wounds of childhood. And it just made me think that, you know, I'm sure with our current um, group that's getting married, you know, similar to me, actually, my husband, um, his parents are divorced as well. And so if you were to go through a divorce, you you've almost then been through two, right? You've had the one as a child that you were part of, and then um, the second. And so I could see that that there would maybe be some some wounds there and and then maybe baggage or, or whatever we want to call it um would be really challenging well there's that and then there's also uh if i could take a few minutes and just talk about what so often happens and so when we fall in love we're not just falling in love with the individual 
on on a subconscious level, we're falling in love with something that's very familiar. I was just actually speaking to a neuroscientist for my podcast, and she talked about how the brain does this. And so you may have come from a family with uh, alcoholism, addiction, uh, infidelity, um, uh, rage, uh, 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 the silent treatment. And very often we marry a version of our parents. And in the beginning, there's the honeymoon stage and everything's beautiful and wonderful. And then uh, kids come, finances come, less time comes, like all the stresses. And so often our clients find that they have been almost living a blueprint of some variation in the dance of the husband and the wife or the partner and the partner, as the case may be. Um, and so the wounds of the childhood are if I come from a household, like I came from a household, my dad was an alcoholic, a jolly one, but an alcoholic. My mom was a codependent and a rageaholic. And when I looked in the mirror with a two and four and a half year old, I saw my codependent rageaholic self looking back at me. And I was like, holy shit. Um, I got to do something about this. I've just become, I have become a person that I don't like, and it's very familiar. And I could talk about what I saw in my spouse with my parents and, and vice versa. And so wounds of the childhood um, really do play a part because our first intimate relationship is with our mom and our dad and our siblings and whatever that interplay is, when we go out and we fall in love, we meet, people whose family of origin interplay, they, they connect like puzzle pieces. And in a healthy relationship and a safe relationship, when those wounds come to the surface, you love each other and you support each other and you give each other, the, you hold the space to heal and refine. That happens in healthy relationships with a certain level of emotional intelligence. Um, I didn't have that level of emotional intelligence. I was not nearly as aware of all of that. And so uh, in many marriages, you end up having this kind of blame and accusation, these um, emotional grenades that get tossed across the room and you're not so compassionate anymore. And you see a lot of faults in the other person and, and things can really fall apart. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And, you know, yeah, I could see in sort of that first case that you were talking about holding the space, you know, maybe that's when somebody's seeking out either therapy on their own or working um, through couples counseling, something like that, um, as as you're kind of working through those things, because you're right, they're bound to come up, right? And and as we grow and change, it's, um, yeah, definitely challenge. And, and marriage is a challenge for sure. I don't think I'm yeah. alone in thinking that. <laughs> you have to have, I mean, you put two adults under one roof with different yeah. backgrounds. And if you don't have a bucket full of patience, grace, mercy, compassion, um, it, it can, it can get difficult. And, uh, and, and one person could be doing their work in therapy or coaching and the other person maybe isn't, or they, they, they both are, but uh, they're so triggered or wounded by each other. There's, there's a book by um, Harville and Helen um, Hendricks. It's called getting the love you want. And it's a book for once you are in relationship and they talk, the, the brilliant, brilliant book, highly recommend it. And they talk about how to navigate um, in love, how to navigate rela relationship challenges so that you're both healing and refining instead of tearing each other down. Um, mm. Yeah. So if you're listening, if your listeners are like thinking, I have some issues going on, grab that book, Read yeah. it with your partner. Uh, it's it's su and it's like a coaching book. So the the appendix is all these exercises, and it's super helpful, powerful. It will move you in the right direction if both you and your partner are interested in it. No, that sounds that sounds great. 
Have you read my novel Pendulum by S.E. German yet? If not, what are you waiting for? And if you have, I would love to hear from you. If you don't know about Pendulum, it's a heartwarming story about a young boy who starts to experience neuropsychiatric symptoms after an infection. We follow the boy as he goes through many regular, real middle grade issues like moving, having a crush, playing sports, Also, while experiencing neuropsychiatric symptoms like anxiety, OCD, tics, panic attacks, and more. If you're interested in checking out Pendulum by S.E. German, it is available through Amazon Worldwide, where you can even see a preview of the book. Or you can listen to Chapter 1, which is on Episode 64 of the Learning to Slay the Beast podcast. I hope you enjoy the novel, and thanks for your support. So I know within divorce, boundaries can be a real issue as well. And so, you know, this is something I even talked a little bit about on some of the previous podcasts, but I'm wondering kind of from your perspective, how does one set and uphold um, boundaries during divorce and, and afterwards? Yeah. So I, I had written an article years ago, I, every healthy relationship requires healthy boundaries. Your relationship uh, with your spouse, uh, your siblings, your parents, your kids, everything. There, There's no way to have a healthy relationship without healthy boundaries. And so for those of you, like myself, who were raised in a household where the word, you know, you didn't, there were no boundaries. Like we were raised in a boundary oblivious household. It's kind of like being raised in a household where nobody speaks Japanese. You don't know how to speak Japanese, right? And so, um, so learning about boundaries is important for all of us. And, and on the most basic level, uh, there's a lot of boundaries with yourself. So one of the things I noticed the most with a lot of my clients is he made me sh- feel, she made me do. So right there, uh, a healthy boundary is nobody can make you feel. Somebody can do something and you can feel a certain way, but they can't make you feel that and they can't make you do. Maybe if they have a gun to your head, but shy of that, like that whole concept that another individual has the power over my feelings, my thoughts, my feelings, and my actions is wrong. And it may sound like semantics, but if I could explain, if you have two people who are in a a relationship with somebody, let's say it's a working relationship and that somebody has a bad day, they're triggered, they come out, they yell, they scream, they berate, they belittle. And one of those people came from a healthy boundary relationship and uh, family and the other one came from maybe some abuse. They're feel, they, they experience the exact same thing. One person is devastated, crushed, worried about losing their job, feels like a victim of, right? That's the person who came from abuse. The person who came from healthy boundaries is going to have a very different take on it and very different feelings. They may feel like, ouch, and wow, uh, my boss or whoever it is, is really triggered. And they may even follow up with a conversation saying, look, it, it sounds like like everything blew up and you're really upset, but we got to talk about like the way you spoke to me, that that's not really acceptable. I didn't sign up for that. And I just, I want to set a boundary that, you know, that that's not happening again, if I'm staying. And so you can see how the person who was reactive didn't make those two individuals feel anything. The individuals felt what they felt based on their history um, and acted the way they acted based on their history. Does that make sense? Yeah. Oh, for sure. I think that makes a lot of sense. And so I guess, you know, I'll be honest, I come from a background with the less healthy boundaries. I'm more on that side. Um, And so how do you kind of walk somebody through figuring out how to do those really in any relationship, as you mentioned. Exactly. Like, yeah. Yeah. It's a great question. And so uh, what a boundary, if Sarah, if someone came up to you and they started talking to you and their nose was two inches away from your nose, what would you do? Yeah. You would take a step back, like make your space. Yeah. And so boundaries are just that. And so you may know that, um, you're an introvert and you need a space 
And so you're in this relationship and it's hot and it's steamy and, uh, and, and you totally dig the person, but you need space. And then perhaps you'll say, eh, I don't want to, I don't, I, I don't want him or her to get the wrong idea. And we're having such, and so I'll swallow what I need and I won't mm. say anything. Um, that's a broken boundary as opposed to a totally dig you, uh, can't see you seven nights a week or, um, or, you know, or sleepovers don't happen for me because of my, whatever my values for X amount of time. And so, Part of it is getting clear on what do I need? And when I figure out what I need, so for me, um, I was in a very verbally and emotionally abusive marriage. And so I am super keen on how people react. And it's like, you're not a bad person for reacting. However, um, that's not going to work for me. You sound really triggered. I tell you what, why don't we pause this conversation and have it again when cooler heads prevail? That's a boundary. Um, mm. In in high conflict situations, a boundary is uh, I keep receiving, you know, texts that might be critical or accusing or so I may set a boundary that uh, if you keep communicating with me that way, verbally, through email, through text, uh, I'm not going to be reading them. And so I need you to know that. And when I deal with co-parents, people who are going through divorce and have children, you have to communicate for years yeah. and years and years post-divorce. And so getting really clear on what your boundaries are. Someone can, you, what's, what's the saying? Um, uh, you don't have to accept an invitation to every fight you're invited to. Right. So it's like, yeah, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm not, uh, let's choose to disagree. Like a statement is a boundary. Um, I, I hear you. Um, and I understand you're upset and, uh, I have a different perspective, but why don't we agree to disagree? That's a boundary. And so when we start looking at what do I need and how can I feel safe and how can I create an emotional space so that, I, um, I'm honoring myself. That's the setting of the boundary. And then the upholding of the boundary is like a whole different thing. So understanding that boundaries are valuable, they're not bad, they're not wrong. And we all have different ones because we have different needs is part one. And then do you have any questions on the setting of boundaries? Cause the, the second half of it, it's like a two-step dance. The upholding of a boundary is a, a whole different skill set. No, I mean, I think the setting part. Yeah. Like, so basically you're kind of doing some soul searching in terms of like, what is it that's making you uncomfortable? What are the things that you personally need from whatever the relationship is? That's right. You may be working for someone who, you know, you were told it was a 40 hour a week job and you were making this amount of money. And then every time you turn around, you're being asked to come in on Saturday to stay two hours later and you can feel the victim. And then you can get all angry and resentful and bitter. And, 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 in, and the truth is you were hired for 40 hours and you have an opportunity to say, Hey, you know, when we sat down and talked, this was a 40 hour a week job. I'm noticing that it went from 40 to 42 to, to 50. And this isn't working for me. I need to sit down and talk about this. Like that's setting a boundary. And then you, you talk and then hopefully you can work it out, but your boundary is whatever it is. I don't mind a couple of hours on occasion, but not 10 hours a week or whatever the case may be. So on all different levels, getting clear on what's going on, that isn't working for me. And then without blame and accusation, like a beautiful statement is I, I've noticed and I'm requesting, right? So that's a great little tool. I've noticed your behavior or this, this circumstance that's unfolding. And, uh, and this is, I'm requesting my boundary. And I therefore like it's that. And that yeah, way you're no. not going, you, 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 like you're not getting into this. You made me feel, and no, let's leave all of that behind. I've noticed a behavior or a situation, and here's my request. Nice and clean, nice and easy. Yeah, it's not in that blame phrasing. It's, uh, that's great. Okay, no, that's really helpful.
So yeah, why don't we move on to then, I loved the term you used, broken boundary. Like how do we uphold them? Right. Right. So people who are boundary oblivious, and it sounds like you and I came from a similar boundaryless um, family of origin, uh, people who, we may also connect with boundary oblivious people who plow the boundary down. Oh, okay, okay, okay. And then they do it anyway. And that's another opportunity to be angry and feel the victim and blame and get resentful. But the truth is we do have all of the power and the power is in upholding the boundary. And I think that this is where people get it very upside down. So um, let's say you're in a relationship. Okay. So you're married and you guys have some financial agreements. Uh, An example, Uh, either of us could spend $500 a month without asking the other person's permission, but anything over that, you know, we need to sit and talk about it. Like that's it. And then that doesn't happen. And your, you know, your, your spouse goes out and, you know, buy some big toy for himself and, and the boundary has been broken. And so, uh, upholding the boundary, you can say to the other person, you can't do this. We agreed to this. Don't do this. Don't do this. Don't do this. But that's an effort to get them to change. Now in a good relationship, you might say it once and that's it. It's fine. That's upholding a boundary. But if they plow it down over and over again, then the question is, how do I honor my boundary? And in a financial situation, it might be, we need to adjust the way we're managing finances, right? I may hold on to my my income, you hold on to yours. Like that could be a complicated one. If it's a situation where uh, I need my space and when I'm praying, meditating, doing yoga, please don't, you know, please don't come in the room. And then they just keep coming in the room and not, uh, not honoring your boundary, then you honor your boundary. It's like, well, I can't, there's no lock on the door. Okay, so buy a lock and put a lock on the door. Boom, done, I've honored my boundary. Now they might get angry. Then then we get into the fact that, okay, well, this boundary issue is actually uh, a symptom of deeper problems in the relationship. But but that's a great way to find out too. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. Okay, so, you know, first you would sort of try the smaller movement and then it would be doing it to honor your own. And then, yeah, you may, there may need to more work. Is kind of <laughs> what yeah, I'm so hearing. you set the boundary, you, the first time you go to uphold it, you can say, look, this is the boundary, you broke it, maybe you forgot, whatever, um, this this is it, you know, I'm, I'm, I really, I need you to respect this. And then what people do is when, when it's not respected, they just keep going back and I need you to respect it. And I'm going to say it louder and I'm going to say it yeah. more often and I'm, I'm not going to kick, kick and scream and I'm going <laughs> to, okay. So nobody's honoring anything there. So if, if the person you're engaged with isn't honoring that boundary after you request it, then, then you need to stop, slow it down and say, how do I uphold this boundary? How do I honor what I need? And, and that's where the power is. Then you feel fully empowered to take care of your needs, regardless of who you're in this relationship with. Okay. Yeah, no, that makes a ton of sense. And, and I'm sure even throughout divorce, there's a lot of challenges with boundaries, um, kind of with your, your ex partner and all of that as well when children come in, you know, you could have, you could have time issues. I I've had so many clients who say, you know, mom or dad committed to picking up the kids at X number at, at such and such a time. And I'm so angry because they never do, you know, they're, they're always a half hour late or they just don't show up or whatever. And so it's like, if you know that's happening and then they blow up my plans and then everything. And so you could imagine the anger, the frustration, the bitterness that could come up. And so Mm -hmm. uh, uh, this is a, another example is when we accept that somebody shows up a certain way. So if someone's often late or, uh, they're unreliable and yet you're a hundred percent banking on them, then kind of shame on you. It's like, you know, this, you, you've divorced this person, you've been together for how many years, this is, this is a shortcoming of theirs. 
And so your boundary is a plan B and a number of clients, I said, okay, so let's say he or she is always, or can be up to an hour late and it blows up your, your plans, have a plan B, have a mother's helper, a babysitter, a parent, somebody who, um, who you have, uh, waiting, who, who you have, who's going to step in and, um, bridge the gap. And so no worries, no worries. I still get my night or my situation and, and I'm already planning for something that I know happens so often. So now I'm, my boundary is I, I am not going to have my plans, um, upended because of your behavior. Great. I found a way to deal with it. Boom, we move on. One less thing to fight and yell about. Most people want to just change the other person. And I'm like, mm-hmm. if you could have changed them, you would not be talking to me. <laughs> you know, it's like that's that's that ship has sailed. So let let's get real with how you are and how he or she is, and let's figure out the most peaceful way for your children, for each of you to move forward. Boundaries is always in the center of that. Yeah. And I mean, I think it goes back to even that powerless feeling. I mean, when you've kind of set yourself up almost for success there, you you sort of take that power back. Exactly. You feel very empowered because you're in control. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And and okay. the whole he made me, she made me feel or think or like right from the get go, we're, we're giving up our control and our power. Okay, that makes sense. So let's dig a little bit further into the parenting side of things. You know, we talked about when kids come in and and it it is definitely more challenging. So where can we focus or how can we really parent effectively through divorce in order to help our children cope with this new situation as well? Yeah, that I mean, that's such a multi-tiered topic. So on the one hand, uh, you know, the rule of thumb is, you both love the children. And so you don't want to air anything. And I don't care if they're six, 16, 26, 36, you don't air the issues with your soon to be ex to the children, even the adult children. It's really, it's incredibly harmful. I am half of my mom and half of my dad. You trash my dad, you trash half of me. And so, and it gets very confusing because there's loyalty, there's a guilt and shame because I have to be loyal to mom or loyal to dad. And it just, it does a lot of psychological damage to humans, whether they're young children or adult children. So, so that's, that's one piece of it. And, uh, and then the other piece, I tend to work a lot with high conflict divorces. So if you have more of your garden variety, reasonably amicable divorce, uh, the best thing for the children is that uh, there are similar rules under both households, that if a child has a punishment or consequences, that it's honored in both households. And, um, and that you're really, you're really beautiful partners post divorce in raising these people that you love and brought into the world. In high conflict uh, divorce, co- amicable co parenting is often just not a possibility mm-hmm. because one one party, if not both tend to be very triggered and conflict oriented. And in that case, uh, you, there's two things. One is it's often called parallel parenting. So you do with the kids in your house, what you do. And I do with the kids in my household, what I do. Is it perfect? No, but you know what? The children grow up with different teachers, different coaches, different bosses. It's not like devastating. It's just, it, it, they learn earlier that different people have different rules and wherever I am, those are the rules I have to abide by where mm-hmm. it gets really important with the, with any conflict is that uh, it comes back to the same thing. You're not going to change your soon to be ex. You're not going to change your co-parent. So when a problem arises, um, my daughter used to always say, I want you to take me to soccer practice because daddy's always late and it embarrasses me. I mean, I could call daddy, you know, until the cows come home and 
tell him that he shouldn't be late, but really what's that going to do? And so the opportunity is to really teach your children. So, so this is, this is what I find one of the silver linings is um, what's the situation? How does it make you feel? What would you like to say to your dad? Um, If you're not saying it, why aren't you saying it? And, and literally like, for me, it's coaching, right? You're talking through with your child, what do you need and what are you afraid of? And and when you do that, you're raising the emotional intelligence of your children and you're teaching your children to be empowered to speak their voice. Now, at the end of this particular situation, um, it may have been that I, I could uh, take some of that over and then, and then, and if dad allowed for that, that was supportive to my daughter. Um, but in, in many situations, uh, if a child has a problem with the other parent, either their kids can be very manipulative too. They can try and pit the two parents against each other. And so you have to be very aware of that. And when you ask, and this is for parenting in general, as parents, we tell more than we ask. And what I say to all parents is God gave us two ears and one mouth, spend more time listening and less time telling. And you'll not only learn more about your child, but your child will learn more about themselves. And and so that's like a golden rule for us when we uh, support people through co-parenting. Oh, I like that. That is a really good, yeah, overall parenting piece for sure. Um, and I guess, you know, when you mentioned that coaching aspect, it made me think of, um, you know, maybe the opportunity for therapy and and different things like that for, for children during divorce. Um, do you find that that type of coaching and stuff could help maybe that the child then for maybe repeating those same things in their own relationship? Well, I think that, um, I think that's an amazing question and I'm a big fan of breaking generational chains. And so my desire, and I have my, my children are now 23 and 25, my desire. And I started saying this early on is if I could raise a daughter who stands in her power and doesn't lose her voice, right? And a son who who is soft-hearted and kind and loving and not not embarrassed or afraid to to love beautifully, then I could fail at everything else and I'll be a success. And I think that as parents when we can step back and say, here are my, here's where I'm reactive. Here's where my shortcomings are. Here's the stuff that, that I am repeating from my family of origin. And I don't want my children to repeat it. That's where pausing, not reacting, asking them questions, guiding them to be their best selves can start when they're in grade school. And, Yes, therapy is, I mean, I think therapy is so often needed. A lot of schools have things like, it's almost like a group therapy. My kid's school, it was called the Banana Splits Program, where children are sitting around at, you know, 6 to 12 years old talking about their feelings and what they can do about it and how they can communicate it in a healthy way. So when young people face trial and tribulation, our heart breaks for them they also can, with the right parent, focus. They can emerge stronger, healthier, more articulate, more uh, aware of their emotions and their needs. And that can be a beautiful thing. And that can absolutely break generational chains. Yeah, that sounds amazing. And, and you're right, like, um, kind of a lifelong parenting goal, I suppose. (laughs) Um, 
So I know also you're a relationship coach and that, you know, works into helping to break some of those unhelpful patterns. So I know we touched a little bit on codependence already. I wondered if you could just dive a little bit further into it. I think um, it's something that some of us are super familiar with, but then others maybe don't even recognize that that is a behavior that we're doing. Um, and, and just kind of if you could touch on some of the more healthier ways to engage with your partner. Yeah. And so I think the most important thing to start with is your codependence does not start in your relationship. It starts in your family of origin. And this has blown me away a little bit. So I, I came from an alcoholic family and um, Melanie Beatty is, is it Melody Beatty? Melanie Beatty. I always forget that. She is like the, you know, the, the queen of codependence. She has a ton of books out there. Um, uh, letting go with love, codependent, no more. And she, she really comes at it from the alcoholics. So there's dysfunction in the family of origin. And what happens is we lose our innocence. And as a child, we take on the role of taking care of a parent. And it's not just alcoholism. If you come from a family where there's a personality disorder, like a, a borderline personality, narcissism is such a big you know, word these days, um, uh, the, one of your parents is going to be a codependent. I have a client, his mom, uh, had some kind of, uh, what was it? She had a, a different kind of mental illness. And so her, so she was limited in what she could do. So dad, dad became like quite the caretaker and it's fine to be a caretaker, but when you take care of others, and you don't take care of yourself, you're not even on the list. Um, that's where trouble comes down the road. Uh, the, the best way I could put this is the coping mechanism, the coping mechanisms that we develop instinctually, intuitively as children to protect ourselves become the same behaviors that destroy our adult relationships. And a couple of other ways that one can become a codependent. I had one client, his dad died when he was very young. So he was like eight years old, he became the man of the house. And so he was doing, doing, doing from such a young age. So what does he do? He marries someone who expects him to do everything. He does everything. She does very little bit. He's totally codependent. He's angry at her because he's not taking care of himself. He's taking care of her and the whole thing goes down the toilet. So there's many ways where we develop as children codependent behavior, codependent behavior in a very little nutshell being taking care of others' needs over our own to the point at which we don't even think about our own needs. We're not even aware of our own needs. And then we can be a martyr about it because then we're doing, doing, doing for everybody and nobody appreciates us. And then in relationship, uh, and especially, you know, when you're young in a marriage and there are children, right? There's so little time. And of course, we're doing everything for our children. We have to at that age. Uh, and you can start looking. It's like, is this balanced? Do we have a balanced relationship going on here? And uh, does my partner honor the fact that I need time and that, and and does my partner do for me as I do for him or her. And, and it's pretty quick to start seeing where there's an imbalance and where there's an imbalance, it's only going to get greater with time. And, uh, and, and as the family grows or as, you know, uh, the finances uh, need to be stretched or what have you. And so when you're, codependent. And I like to say it's kind of triplets. If, if you're codependent, which I am a recovering codependent, you tend also to be a people pleaser and maybe a perfectionist. And so those are the triplets that often go hand in hand with each other. And uh, I used to be very proud of being a perfectionist, but there's nothing really to be proud of because it's very black and white and you're very hard on yourself and others. And the same thing with codependence. I have an article on my website, journeybeyonddivorce.com that it's entitled, are you a codependent? It's a questionnaire with like 25 questions. And, you know, do you say yes when you want to say no? Do you 
Um, do you get concerned when your spouse is going out with friends? Like, is there a jealousy thing that goes on? Um, do you, uh, do you take care of yourself when you need to? And 25 questions. And so like everything else, codependence is a spectrum. And so you may be a mild codependent or a really, really kind of lost codependent. That would be a really valuable thing to know so that you could begin to address it. And and the books Codependence No More and uh, Melanie Beattie's uh, whole series of books is a great place to dive into if you feel like anything I'm saying resonates with how you behave. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And I can see too, like when you talk about, well, the triplets coming together for sure. Um, And then also the idea that if you're not taking care of yourself, we've sort of had this shift in, at least I've noticed as a woman, there's kind of this constantly like, you need to do self-care, you need to do self-care kind of thing. And when you are codependent, there probably isn't any time for that. Um, and so I'm just thinking that, that that's, that's like its own challenge, I suppose, is it's hard when you're doing a lot for others to then put in that time for yourself. There, there is no time for yourself. And in fact, this is, this is the interesting twist. Um, when you're codependent, which means that you're, you're not taking care of yourself at all. You're taking care of everyone, but you, you're training your children and your spouse to expect that you're not even on the list, that, that their needs come first. And then you have a wake an awakening one day and you say, you know what, this isn't healthy. I need to start taking care of myself. And so you're taking care of yourself. They are so used to you being, um, uh, selfless that they now see your self care as totally selfish and a codependent. There is no more harsh criticism that we will receive than to be told we're selfish when we're so serving. Right. And you're not being selfish. You're being self loving, but they, they don't know the difference because you've trained them that I love you and I do for you and I don't do for me. And so you actually have to walk through this wall of incredible discomfort. And if you can have compassion for the people who call you selfish, cause you've kind of trained them. And it's like, I, I could see where you see it that way. Um, but that's not what it is. And that's where you really have to stand your ground. And uh, you know, um, maybe dad goes golfing and it's like, yeah, I'm going to go out with the girls, you know, once a week or once a month or whatever. I'm going to, I'm going to take the the two hours and go to my yoga class or, you know, whatever it is that you're interested in doing. And so um, it's really, it's really important that you stop and say, am I, am I taking care of myself? I'm taking care of everyone else really well. And if the first thought that crosses your mind is there's no time, ding, 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 go look at that (laughs) questionnaire and take a look because um, self-care, this is a marathon. Marriage and raising children is a marathon. Self-care is absolutely vital. It's a vital part of it. Yeah, nope, that makes a ton of sense. And and I can see, well, and I know just women generally, like that is a big challenge. You know, you do get into that habit, especially with young kids of, you know, being that selfless kind of person, you know, and so yeah, that that makes a lot of sense. Um, I wondered before we move into wrapping up, are there any additional tools or advice or even, you know, related to explaining your program a little bit further that you want to touch on to mention to the listeners? I think uh, what I'd like to mention is we have um, we have an online program called the 12 step divorce recovery program. And that's really 12 steps to overcome uh, heartbreak and breakup. It's, it's not about the legal divorce, the practical divorce at all. It's actually about the emotional divorce. So whether you're uh, living with someone and you have a breakup and you just find yourself, you know, just in a tailspin, um, the 12 step divorce recovery program offers 12 key areas that we've found everyone who goes through breakup, like 
struggles with. And so step one is curb the conflict. And how do you, how do you create some space so that there's less of that hostility and conflict? And, and there's often a lot of chaotic thinking. And step three is about calming the chaos and understanding what's happening between your ears. Like when you ruminate and you go round and round and you have the argument with the other person over and over again, and you're like all stressed out and it's just not helping anything. Um, We talk about being problem uh, solution oriented rather than problem oriented. Uh, we have a, a step on how to stay present and how all of your power is in the present and not in um, fretting the past or worrying the future. And so a, a step on acceptance, a step on grieving and healing. And so, um, and that also has a, a monthly call, a 90 minute call. So it's not like totally on your own. You actually get some nice coaching. So I would say that that's a great program for anyone who's in a relationship. And even if you're in a marriage and you're kind of on the fence and you're thinking, you know, can I mend this? Should I end this? That 12 step program is going to be brilliant in helping you to keep the focus on yourself and see what's going on with you and what you need to heal and refine in you. And while you do that work, the decision of whether to enter mint tends to um, figure itself out. So, so that would be the, the, the one program that we have. So we do a lot of one-on-one coaching. We have our journey beyond divorce podcast, which has a ton of great content in it about breakups and divorce. And then that online program is really powerful for people who want to work through the emotions and not make the same mistake the next time around. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. That's great. And, and your podcast sounds great as well. So How else can listeners connect with you? Is it best on social media or through your website? You know, I'd like to just put one thing out there. We have uh, what we call a rapid relief call. It is a one hour coaching call on the house for anybody who, uh, who wants to see how we work and if it's the support for them. And you could go to rapidreliefcall.com and book a call with me or any of the coaches on my team. And, uh, and you will absolutely walk away with value. So, uh, so that's a that's a great way to reach out. Oh, that sounds perfect. Yeah, especially when you're just not even sure what to do next. That's I'm sure a great tool. Yeah, it'll help people gain clarity and uh, and just understand where they are a little bit more. And that's our pleasure to do. Perfect. Well, thank you so much, Karen, for all of this wonderful advice on relationships, breakups, divorce today. I think it'll be really helpful for listeners and, and, you know, has probably got them even thinking about some new terms or ways to kind of work through problems than, than maybe they've thought about before. So I really appreciate your time today. Sarah, thanks so much for having me. And we did, we covered actually quite the plethora of topics. So good. Um, I hope there's a lot of value in there for your listeners. And it's been a pleasure chatting with you. Absolutely. It's been a pleasure for me as well. Thanks so much. About a year ago, we got a new puppy named Charlie. Charlie is a lab collie crossed with an Australian cattle dog, a blue healer. And Charlie is a super chewer. He chews anything he can get his hands on, blankets. He chews any toy that we get and destroys it within a few seconds. So this is why I'm excited to give Charlie the BarkBox Super Chewer. BarkBox Super Chewer comes with two tough toys that are always fluff free because Charlie can destroy anything with fluff. He literally can find the weak link in that toy and then he just goes to town. It also comes with two full-size bags of treats that are customizable for allergy or diet preferences and then two all natural meaty chews. So you can also get your dog, especially if he's a super chewer, a BarkBox super chewer subscription. And you can use my link, which is www.superchewer.com slash real life. And this link gives you an extra free month of super chewer, which is valued at $45 and is valid on the multi-length 
length plan. So you can sign up with three months or six months or a year and then see what you like in terms of keeping your dog happy and not chewing the things that he shouldn't be chewing like Charlie did when we first got him and he chewed the corners of our walls and our trim in our house and our couch and so many things. So get BarkBox Super Chewer. And again, my link is www.superchewer.com slash real life. Thank you for listening to the Learning to Slay the Beast podcast. Please keep in mind, this podcast is not intended to be medical or professional advice. If you'd like to hear more from me, you can follow me on social media, Instagram and TikTok at Sarah Lady Gluten or Facebook, Sarah underscore Gluten Free Lady. You can also visit my website, which includes author information, speaking information, and more info on the podcast at www.se-german.com. If you like the podcast, please feel free to review the podcast on your favorite platform and also subscribe because it means that it will show up for you every week on your favorite podcast platform. Also, we've just started to have the ability to support the podcast. You can find this link in my Instagram bio or visit Kofi, K-O hyphen F-I dot com slash learning to slay the beasts. Thanks again for listening and have a great week. Mm-hmm.